Uh, hey, Jay, uh, crazy world we're in today, isn't it? It is unbelievable. Uh, I have been in business for 21 years and never uh, seen anything like what we're experiencing right now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, 33 years for us at Grandy Associates, and it's the same thing. I mean, we've never experienced, we've had certainly highs and we've had, you know, uh, challenges, but we've never had anything that's that's been like this. And so, so, so you called me, um, I don't know, a day or two ago and, and had this idea to have this conversation together, which I'm really excited about. I think mm -hmm. uh, right now, especially in the news, there's a lot of panic. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of chaos. And, and, and your idea, which I thought was great, was for you and I just to have a conversation for other business owners who are right in the middle of this, trying to make tough decisions and maybe scared about the future, trying to figure out what to do. And we had some points we're kind of going to kind of go through with them, uh, which I think will be really helpful. Yeah, one of the things that I found really uh, interesting is over the last week, week and a half, I've talked to a bunch of different uh, uh, customers who are you know, across the, the country. And one of the things that I hear over and over again is, but what do we do? Where do we go? How do we handle this? You know, I can't, you know, how, how are we going to survive? You know, and, and, and there is this sense of, of fear that's there. And that's not, uh, it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, it, it really doesn't. So I uh, agree with you totally that, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about how do we lead through this issue, right? Because quite frankly, as leaders of, of, of the companies, right, that, that both you and I are dealing with and, and companies across this nation is, is how do we lead through this, right? Somebody has to lead the charge. Somebody has to do that. And, and, and how the leader goes can absolutely set the tone for how they come out the other end on this entire thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest risks right now in a lot of organizations. And, and there's a lot of pressure, I think, for leaders in general mm -hmm. to feel like they have to have all the answers. And I don't think that as leaders, we have to have all the answers, but we do um, need to do a certain, uh, we, there are certain things we do need to do along the way. And one right. of them certainly is to step back a little bit, not panic, um, not freak out for lack of a better term, right. because if, if, if our teams see us freaking out, um, it's only going to strike fear amongst everybody. And if everybody's living and making decisions out of fear, it's very rare that good decisions come out of fear. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why that, you know, that first thing that I always say is, is okay, for, you got to take just a moment and just breathe. Right. There's, there's so many, so many company owners or, and leaders that haven't taken a breath in two weeks. Yeah. Right? They're just, they're, 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 they're waiting for their world to crash down. And, 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 and again, we just have to just take a moment and just, okay, let's just stop and regroup and kind of think where are we at and what is the reality as far as we're at, you know, and, and, and what can I do about it? Right. And, and there are things that are out of our control. There's no question, but there's a whole bunch that's in our control. There's things that we can do within our position in our role that, that can absolutely steer our company toward success and coming out of the other end of this thing. Uh, um, quite frankly, in some ways, possibly even stronger than when we came yeah. into this thing. Yeah. I heard this um, really great analogy the other day, and I think it came from a Harvard business review article. I've been quoting this over and over again. And they basically gave the analogy of a race, uh, race car track, basically, mm -hmm. and a bunch of cars coming into a sharp curve. And the idea was essentially that all businesses go through sharp curves in business at some point. And you guys have been in business for decades. We've been in business for decades. Some people listening maybe have been in that same place, but none of us have seen anything quite like this. This is a very mm -hmm. unique scenario um, but, but the way the analogy worked was basically this, some race cars, as they come into the corner, they apply their brakes too hard and they don't have the right angle going into the curve. And because they've slammed on their brakes, they have a really hard time accelerating again and they fall way behind or aren't mm -hmm. able to finish the race at all. The other people fall off the opposite end of the curve, is, which is they don't slow down at all. They don't take a breath, like you said. They, they, they don't take a minute to kind of go, hold on, what's going on here? Let's just, let's survey the land. Let's take a deep breath. Let's step back. They don't do that. They just press the accelerator through the curve and go, it's fine. I'm not changing anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not paying attention. I'm just going to drive on. Those cars typically crash. Right. But the cars that win the races and the businesses that win the races out of recessions uh, are, are usually the ones that see the curve approaching they put a little bit of a break on and, and then as they start to turn, they have the right angle on the turn and then they accelerate out of the turn. And, and those can actually be the moments where businesses in this Harvard Business Review article, they have this graph and they show 
the businesses that do that successfully actually accelerate out of recessions, not mm -hmm. the other way around. Sure. And many people just kind of remain flat and then obviously others don't make it. You know, that's, that's an incredible analogy. I love that because some of the some of our customers know that uh, one of the things that I kind of do as a hobby is my next door neighbor is a Formula 1000 race car driver, right? So open wheel, 140, 150 miles an hour. Two cars come in contact with each other. When you're open wheel, somebody's going airborne. Yeah. And, and, and I think back to that exact analogy, Jay, we've got a, a track here, a road course here, uh, uh, not too far away that, that really is our home course. And, and there's a point on the course where you come over the apex of a hill at the fastest speeds on the track, literally 145, 150 miles an hour. And 300 yards later is a hard left-hand turn. So in 300 yards, you have to go from the fastest spot on the track to the absolute slowest spot on the track. And like you said, control your way through that curve. Now, the problem is, you know, I'll take that analogy one step farther, because it really is a good analogy, is that, that you know, okay, I'm coming up on this curve, and I've got to, you know, uh, manage the, my way through it, you know, the angle, the speeds, the, the, you know, all, everything else. But I can do that by myself, but then the challenge is there's another car right next to me, mm -hmm. and, 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 and he screws it up, and I have to kind of be responding to him a little bit as well. Right. And so, uh, you know, how do you know, and that is also one of the other challenges, right, is is all the other companies that we're dealing with that are impacting us and what we do and how we respond to some of those, uh, the, you know, whether it's them doing things properly or them making mistakes or, 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 you know, all of that impacts us. And that's that's kind of that economic feel that we uh, that, that, that we're currently you know, living in here as well. Yeah. And I think that's part of why we're wanting to have this conversation, mm -hmm. too, is to is to kind of pull the curtain back and let other business owners kind of hopefully glean some ideas, but they may have ideas too, that hopefully they can you know, leave some comments, send an email in and, and share oh, yeah. those with us because uh, Lord knows I, I have spent more time of the last week or two embedding myself in other communities, talking to other business owners, finding out what's working, what, what, are, where, what are they seeing ahead? Because not to overuse this race car analogy, but it, uh, another kind of piece of the puzzle here right now, and I think this is the hardest part is that, we don't have clear visibility of mm -hmm. how sharp that turn is and when it's going to end. And so it's kind of like we're driving in the fog in the rain. Uh, mm -hmm. I watched that new uh, Ford versus Ferrari movie recently, which is really good. And Me there's too. a couple of scenes where he's driving in the rain and driving in the fog. And I think, man, I, I would be dead. There's just no way. And in business, I think right now, that's how people feel. That's how I feel right now is, mm -hmm. is I'm kind of going, okay, I'm in the fog. I'm in the rain a little bit. And I think that getting in good community and speaking to other business owners helps me um, have a little better visibility of what that curve looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the second thing you had on your list here that we were going to talk through, which I think is really relevant as it relates to driving in the darkness yeah. is don't make decisions in fear. I mean, talk about that idea a little bit. Well, I think, you know, again, there's so many that, uh, that again, we look at this, we're afraid we're making, we're making decisions uh, out of fear. And, and the problem is when we make decisions out of fear, we lose all sense of rationality. Mm -hmm. Right. We, 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 we're not making smart decisions at that point. And, and many times the decisions we're making end up hurting us. You know, in fact, quite frankly, they can sometimes put us out of business when we make decisions from that perspective. Right. They're not wise. They're not wise fiscally. They're not wise uh, for my team. They're not wise, quite frankly, for me. If I'm, if I'm basing them out of fear. And I think at that point, uh, you know, a lot of company owners, they're, they're blinded. Um, and so they make decisions without any information right now. Yeah. There's, yeah, I think there's some personality styles that are comfortable making decisions with no information. Doesn't necessarily mean they're good decisions that's right. Right? because you know, some of those you know, individuals go, okay, well, if I made a bad decision, that's okay. I'll make another one. The problem is we've got to make sure that we're making proper decisions right now. So that, that wrong decision that we made doesn't necessarily impact us negatively moving forward. So I think that's so critical that we make decisions, you know, from, you know, what is the best information and, and we're not an island, right? Mm, some, some right. of our customers in both cases are, uh, you know, are, are working in communities where they're in a lockdown or they're, you know, they're, they're ha everybody has to work from, you're still not an island, right? We'll get into one of the things a little bit later that I certainly want to you know, talk to you about because your, your, your team is good at it. Some of the technology that's available today, mm. right? You know, as you said, you mentioned a couple of times that you have reached out to other members of the community or other areas, uh, you know, to, to get a little bit of their perspective. Uh, and, and I have to, you know, what does that do when you're doing that, Jay? What does that do to, uh, to uh, 
address some of the fear that you have as a leader? I think that, you know, one of the things people always say about leadership or about especially small business owners is you hear this term, it's lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. And that is or can be true because nobody's ever going to love your business as much as you love it, especially if you're the owner, especially if you're, especially if you're the founder. If, 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 nobody's going to love it as much as you do. And so it can feel like you're and, and ultimately the buck stops with you. The final decision right. is, hey, what are you going to do? And, and you get to make those calls. Are, are you going to cut payroll down? Are you going to reduce pay? Are you going to just try and write it out? Are you What other expenses can you cut? Uh, you're, you're the one that gets to make those calls. And that can feel lonely and scary. And I think that getting community for me, the other day I was on a, um, a Zoom call and there was a big, you hit that gallery button and you can see all the faces at once. And there were about 20 different agency owners from around the country. We we're actually doing a little happy hour. So we all had a mm -hmm. beverage booth, which was nice too. And <laughs> There was something about that shared camaraderie to go, hey, all of these people are experiencing something similar to me. Mm -hmm. It's different. All of our lives and experiences and businesses are different, but there is a shared reality to that. And, you know, it's kind of like um, when people go into a dark room mm -hmm. uh, or take it one step further and do like a Halloween, like a haunted house. My, uh, I've been down to Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios, which is pretty wild adventure. And what you'll mm -hmm. see in those environments is the darker and the scarier it gets, the closer people get together. They, 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 and this is definitely not uh, uh, COVID-19 certified. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Nobody's six foot apart, but people that would not normally touch each other are literally like almost on top of each other, holding hands, grabbing arms. You'll see grown men grabbing the arms of other grown men as they go through these dark rooms. And the, the thing is, they're not scared of the dark. Right. They're scared of what's in the dark. The unknown. And, and I think that's what's happening right now is we're not really scared of, of, of business turmoil. To some extent, those of us who are like born leaders and entrepreneurs, this is what we're made for. This is like, let, let's like, give me some challenge. I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. But the darkness in the room makes us want to cling on to each other. And we can't do that physically. But I've found that I've actually had more access to people who I wouldn't normally have access to because they're not at events. They're not speaking at conferences. Right. They're not in the office. They're not in a meeting. And so they're available for a Zoom call that they would never be before. So all of a sudden, there's ability to connect with people that might be kind of higher up the food chain, if you will, from an experience standpoint. And that has just really been helpful to me mm -hmm. because I, I know I'm not alone. And I know that there's other people who, despite how like big and fancy they seem, they're willing to give advice and counsel too. Mm -hmm. And I need that. I need somebody that's pouring into me as much as I need to be pouring into other people. So that's helpful. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Some of the, you know, and it's an interesting comment, right? Because this conversation wouldn't be happening. Otherwise I'd have been standing in front of a group of people right, right. on the East coast today. So uh, that's absolutely true. You know, the, I think the other thing too, is that's where sometimes the, you know, depending on um, your individual company, why, um, you know, associations and you know, some of yeah. those organizations are so important. I've been watching some of the chat boards and, you know, coming out of some of the uh, associations uh, in, in my space and, you know, just some of the conversation from business leaders, some of the, um, you know, the assistance that they give each other, some of the, um, you know, just you know, kind of hang in there or, you know, here, just solid, good, solid advice. Here's what yes. we're doing to address this situation. I think that is, again, th there's a lot of comfort that comes in, in being able to communicate with other people. That's a really important point. And I think that need, needs to be talked about more. Maybe that's a whole blog post actually is, is around associations or organizations or groups. Um, I, I think that there's value in organizations that are both directly in your uh, wheelhouse. So like if you're in the HVAC mm -hmm. business, you're in groups of other people who own HVAC businesses. And then there's also value in being in groups of other business owners. For me, you know, right now, for example, I have two specific groups that have been just lifesavers over the last two weeks. One is called the Bureau of Digital. I'm a digital marketing agency for people who don't know who I am. Uh, help people market and grow their businesses. So I'm in this group called the Bureau of Digital and everybody in there owns a digital agency somewhere around the world. Mm -hmm. They all have been through very similar things that I exactly like or very close to exactly like what we're going through. And then the other one that I'm uh, really a part of is Entree Leadership, which is Dave Ramsey's mm -hmm. organization. Lots of small uh -huh. business owners from all over the country, all over the world really. Um, who are experiencing different things, but I found that even somebody in a different industry, there's can be a lot of parallel. You might be able to bring some insight from your industry into their industry, or they might bring some insight from their industry into your industry that is a little bit of a crossover that you might not get within your own area. So I think that that's a really big point of associations, 
group memberships, those make a huge difference now, especially if you have already invested in those communities before crisis strikes. Right. So uh, let me build one more step on that because you talk about that second association that you belong to, uh, you know, Entree Leadership, right, which is a phenomenal organization. Uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, so many business leaders go, well, how is somebody in a different uh, type of business going to help me? Yeah. Right? Business is business is business. That's right. right. Yes, your widget may be a little bit different. The way you provide your products and services may be a little bit different, but you know, when it comes down to blocking and tackling, there's a lot of commonality. And of course, when, when we're teaching our two-day business workshop, we teach some of those where the entire room is full of one type of company. And then we teach others where it's mixed companies, different types mm -hmm. of companies in, in the room. We find every time there is tremendously more, a, a lot more conversation in the rooms with mixed type companies in there because I can learn from you yeah. Right. There's things that, that you've, you know, I've talked to you over the last couple of weeks and you've helped me with and, and hopefully vice versa. I've given yeah, you a couple sure. of things. And, and, and so, uh, you know, again, that's where that piece of it, don't, don't get blinded by the fact that, um, you know, their company isn't like ours. Yeah. They're absolutely. still a company. Yeah. I think that that piece of the puzzle, it's funny because we didn't really have even that in detail in our notes. And here, here we are talking about these groups and associations. That's right. the value of these kind of conversations is I, I mean, I, I, those groups that I have been in have now now had so much value. The other thing we do have on our list that I think is really important, uh, this has been a th huge thing for me, is turning off the news. Yeah. Um, I, I will admit, first of all, I have very low self-control when it comes to um, the next thing on my phone, especially. So I literally, I kid you not, had to go into parental settings, turn on restricted sites, and add all of the news sites that I would normally go to and put a password on it that I didn't know so that I can't, I cannot look at the news on my phone. I have to be intentional about it. I got to go to a computer. I got to go somewhere else and look something up. Mm -hmm. And so what that's done for me is I still, I still have access to information if I need it, which I we need to stay informed of what's going on. What I don't need is to look at it every 15 minutes. Um, that's not helping anybody. Well, you know, because there again, too, there's, there's two elements to that, right? One is uh, they're never going to report anything that goes, hey, we have this positive thing that just happened in, right. in this community, right? right. It, it's always, you know, breaking news, and it's the worst possible thing that can happen. And, and it's always, you know, you, you, you start to feed into that, right? Yeah. And that starts to create more and more problems, and it affects your psyche. And it starts to take you down at that point. Um, yeah, it, it definitely... I will, it has had negative effects on me. And interestingly, years ago, um, I used to be a real news junkie back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I was going through a season where I was really struggling with kind of some anxiety and depression, maybe not depression, but certainly some, some pretty severe anxiety. And I realized that I thought a lot of it was coming from the news. Mm -hmm. And I actually just totally shut it off. I went cold turkey. I stopped watching TV news. I stopped listening to talk radio. And I would occasionally have a plan to review some specific news sites so I knew what was going on in my community, what was going on mm -hmm. in the world, but I wasn't obsessed with it. And I think especially in this crisis, what I found is um, I know I kind of in, in stress can kind of go back to things that maybe aren't good habits. And for right. one of mine for me was obsessive news gathering. So I literally had to block it off my phone and that's been much better. I literally mm -hmm. feel much better because I cannot look at the news every 15 minutes on my phone and I can focus on things like this that actually have real value. Yep. And, 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 and you know what, you, I, I, you, you made a blog post on that point or a, a, some type of a post. And I saw that, that you had changed and blocked the new sites on, on your devices. And, and it caused me to go back and say, now I haven't blocked them yet, but <laughs> you know, I have probably haven't checked them in two or three days. Um, right. Yeah. And, and it definitely impacts it because here's the other part of that, right. Which kind of leads me into one of the, the other points is that, you know, as you start, you know, living in this world of fear, right? It's, you're watching that news cycle and it's never good and it builds anxiety and it, it builds more fear in you. So it comes back to what we talked about a couple of minutes ago and making mm -hmm. decisions at that point. But what message does that then convey to your team? Right? You, you know, your team at that point, when, when, when you're afraid and you're leading from that position, what are they getting? Right. What message are they getting regarding not only the, the current state of, of you as a leader, but the current state of this company that, that yeah. my livelihood depends on? Right. Especially if you're running a small business, you know, right. uh, because there, there's a certain stability to some extent to working in a large corporation. Maybe not, but, but 
the ones with the right cultures that there is because you know how much money they have in the bank. Mm -hmm. If you work for Apple right now, you know, they have a ton of money in the bank, like they're billions gonna okay. and billions of dollars. They're, they're going to be able to float payroll for quite a while without any worry. Same thing with Facebook, things like that. But small businesses, I think about the unknowns that I have, and I have full access to every single number, every single detail of the current company. I just have unknowns about the economy. Right. And if you think about the team, the team has the same unknowns about the economy in the future, but they also have unknowns about the company itself. Yeah. I mean, how much money do we have in the bank? And how mm -hmm. long is that going to last? And, and how many clients can we afford to lose? And what do we need to do in the meantime? Um, and, and that fear can just get uh, doubled down if the leader is, is acting out of fear and panic too. Well, tied in with that, then, you know, so many of the companies, you know, right? So my company today is going through, right? Our, our state is going into, you know, they're, they're locked down tonight, mm -hmm. right? So um, we're going to be forced to, to work from home. Uh, part of my team works from home and they're comfortable with that. The part that, you know, the, the group that comes into the office every single day, I mean, yes, I'm telling them they're working from home, but there's a sense of, uh, you know, a little bit of anxiety on the part of the team. They're going, okay, I'm, I, I can no longer go into work. Yeah. Right. There's there's a level of uh, I think a fear on a lot of their part that they're going. Well, wait a minute. What does that mean now for my job if I can't go into work right now? You know, and, and so there's, there's there's that that's built into it as well. And how long is my job going to be here? And and all the rest of that. And, and and it's difficult. Just like you can't function as a leader from a position of fear, they can't do their job well right. from a position of fear. Right? Yeah. Because then they go into protection mode too, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about communicating with the team then. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, in general, uh, it's easy to not be a, a great communicator to start. It's easy to not communicate things clearly or often enough to begin with. But in mm -hmm. crisis, I think that that only like is multiplied uh, exponentially, either the pros or the cons of that. So, you know, what's your thought on, you know, that, what that communication rhythm looks like, you know, how are you handling that with your team? Um, maybe we kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a wise uh, thing to, to at least uh, uh, explore a little bit. You know, one of the things that you know, on my team, uh, I'm a firm believer of regular communication with the entire team. Mm -hmm. As a general rule in our company, nine o'clock every Monday morning, we have a team meeting. And, and again, chunk of my team is remote already. And so we do a team, a you know, Zoom meeting uh, uh, every Monday morning. And so the, the, the portion of the company who's, uh, who, who reports into the office every day, right, we're in the conference room and, mm -hmm. and, and we attend the meeting there. Everybody else is t attending the meeting from wherever they are out in the world uh, and they join in. And, and in our part being the Zoom meeting, everybody's turning their camera on. So just like you said earlier, where you could see the, the faces of all these other people, yeah. I think it's important for me, I want my entire team to see the faces of the rest of the team Right. It, 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 and, and I do that in part. Here's the, the, the which leads right into that. For me, part of the reason I do that is because I want the, the team, the members of my team who are remote. To be able to feel a part of and feel closer to the rest of the team. Yeah. And if we can see each other face to face on a weekly basis, it, it builds that more. Now, you know, today, you know, the entire team is scattered. Mm. Right. And so you know, I, I think that piece of the puzzle is even more important. But again, if, if I feel that in normal waters, it's important to meet once a week in these uncharted waters where there's the, uncertain, uh, the uncertainty that's here. I think it's even more important to meet on a regular basis and, and, and talk on a regular basis. As a leader, I feel that I have to be communicating with them and reminding them regularly, okay, where we are. Uh, what are we doing? What is our mission? Why are we here? Right? What's most important? Right? Because sometimes they're still focusing on, uh, you know, this is my job, right? Yeah, I need to yeah, fill right. this role. Well, you know what, today, maybe that's not quite so important. Maybe today, our job is to just call and check in on some of our customers and see how they're doing. Right? And, and that's the best thing that we can do today. You know, and so we kind of shift that focus a little bit. And, and, and it's okay if today you don't quite get done the project that you were working on, right? So somebody, I, th I think somebody needs to lead that. And I think it's absolutely critical as the leader of the company to be communicating with the team even more and reset the expectations. Because the expectations today are different than they were two weeks ago. Yeah. And they're different than they're going to be a month from now. So we always have to be resetting that, especially in the times of, of, of turmoil. How are you handling it on your team? 
Well, uh, we're usually all in the office and we don't have a daily meeting. We have a weekly meeting. Um, and it's been interesting, even on the Zoom call, uh, I don't know if it was this Monday or the Monday before, but there were out of, out of the 18 people that were on the Zoom screen, I think there were three of them didn't have their video turned on. Mm -hmm. And they either weren't in places they could do it or just hadn't planned for it or whatever. And I said, I was like, hey, next time, next time I have this meeting, I need everybody's videos on. Because there's something about needing to focus in, I think, especially for people that have never had a remote team before, because we mm -hmm. operated for fully remote for 16 years. So I'm very comfortable with the technology around pulling that off. And we're functionally designed to operate that way, even though we physically come into the office, at least mm -hmm. how we have for the last four or five years. Um, so, you know, what I have done personally is I've really increased my cadence of communication through Slack and through setting up one-on-ones and setting up Zoom meetings, both individually and in team meetings. I'm also dropping into team meetings more often than I would have normally before. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly my role in that is twofold. One, just to encourage everyone and go, hey, look, I know this is a scary season. Some people have family members that are, you know, they're worried you're going to get sick. Mm -hmm. Some people have friends or family who are already getting laid off or already having pay cuts. And that's scary when you start seeing that around you. Um, and so the waters are already so muddy that people are scared. And I think my, one of my primary responsibilities as a leader is to encourage my team. Hey, we're going to get through this. I'm not going to carry you through this. We're going to get through this together. Right. My job is to help lead us there, but, but we're going to get through this together. And then the other is, like you said, which is to help people focus on what actually matters. Mm -hmm. Because it is easy to get stuck in like our daily tasks, daily routines. And they're, right now, people need to be thinking, where do I need to back up and how can I, what do I really need to focus on right now um, as a priority? But I think for people who have not done remote work before, getting on Zoom, uh, getting comfortable with all the tools and you know, spend a little time just playing with it. Get your whole team on there, spend 15 minutes kind of playing around with all the little features and functions and gallery view up in the top versus speaker view. That's yeah. such a little thing, but understand how you can click gallery and see everybody that's on the meeting at once versus speaker and only see the person talking. That makes a big difference because oh, yeah. it creates more engagement. It's more like sitting around in a room mm -hmm. than it would be otherwise. Um, right making sure that your team has the resources that they need, whether it's, um, you know, a camera on their computer or a laptop or whatever. Some of those things are hard, especially when we're not trying to spend extra money, but mm -hmm. trying to position people as best they can. And then little things like being in a quieter environment when you're trying to do a Zoom call, put yourself in a place where maybe you don't have lighting in a room, but just put your face in front of a window where the, where the, where the light is shining in on you, not the window behind you, where the right. light's shining behind you, people can see you better. Stuff mm -hmm. like that seems so dumb, but just being able to see somebody's face, I think, helps us communicate uh, a lot better. I would agree. I would totally Next agree. thing we have on the list here is kind of your uh, specialty, and I think it's extremely important uh, for business owners. I know I personally have been spending a lot of time um, on this with my accountant, which is know your numbers. Right. Um, what numbers should business owners be going, hey, these are the most important things I need to pay attention to right now. Where should their focus be with regards to figuring out what to look at in this time of crisis? Well, I think, you know, first off, there has never been a time, I mean, I mean, that's kind of our mantra, right? Know your numbers, know your numbers, know your numbers. But there's never been a time where it's more critical to know where your numbers are, right? And specifically, what is your break even rate? What does it cost you to keep the doors open every day? Because in some cases, you know, one of the things that it comes back to, especially if we're in a services type company, whatever the service is, right? It, it, it's, it's what is your break even rate times the number of hours that you're billing out, right? So there's really two numbers, right? Because when you came up with your break even rate, that break even rate was based on a, a certain number of hours that you thought you're going to bill out throughout the year. And so the two numbers that are absolutely critical are, what's my break even rate? What does it cost me to keep the doors open? And how many hours do I need to bill out over the course of a period of time in order to cover that break even rate? Right now, the challenge is for a lot of, uh, a lot of companies is, I know my break even rate, right? it's X number of dollars per hour, but that was based on billing out 3,000 hours over the course of this year. Now, a whole bunch of those hours just went away. Right. I, and I use our company as a prime example, right? So we had, you know, uh, uh, literally um, 64 days, 64 days, man hour days of training that disappeared, mm. right? They either were, uh, uh, were, were postponed or canceled, right? Well, that's a whole bunch of billable time that, that went away. 
right? So, uh, you know, and, and we can look at it and say, well, yeah, that time is going to, you know, they're, they're rescheduling for the fall. Well, that's okay, but all the training that would have normally happened in fall now won't be able to because that time was already booked, right? So, uh, yeah, how many hours at a minimum, right? So, what's my break even rate? How many hours do I have to bill out to be able to uh, maintain the company and make sure that we can, we, we can pay the bills? Uh, um, so, you know, will we take a hit this year? Yeah, we'll take a hit. There's no question about it. Now, one of the other things that that, that comes along with that, and, and hopefully if, you know, if, if you've listened to anything that we've talked about for years, one of the things we've always talked about is creating a Hill and Valley account, mm. right? Uh, you know, creating that rainy day fund. Hopefully you've got a bit of a rainy day fund. Right? For some of you, it might be, you know, in your accounting as retained earnings, that's part of what that is, is profits from a previous year left, left in the company. And, and okay, how can we manage that, 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 that Hill and Valley account? Because from a cash flow standpoint, some of us are in a little bit of a valley, right? Mm -hmm. So how are we going to, you know, it, it's the, the, the cash that we kept that we're going to carry through. Now, if, if we didn't build a Hill and Valley account, we don't have this reserve of cash there. Now it becomes more important to how can we, um, how can we maintain those billable hours as we look at it, uh, as we move forward? Yes, yeah, so that might mean that within your particular world, we have to do things just a little bit differently, mm. right? And, 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 and it was interesting. And, and, and Jay, as a, as a leader, I'll, uh, you know, I, I look at this piece of the puzzle and I look and, and say, well, we do things a certain way, right? And one of my team members a week ago in our team meeting came up and said, well, I think you could teach this particular class online. And it's our flagship program. There's a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with that particular program. And, and I've gone, yeah, but because of that one-on-one -on -one stuff, we can't do it online. Mm. Right. And the next day, you know, I'm talking about, uh, uh, you know, thinking about it, you know, the night before, you know, and, and as a leader, I've got a choice. I've got to get right, a certain number of billable hours to be able to continue to pay the bills. Right. Because I got to know my billable hours and my break even rate. And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I can say, no, that won't work. Or I can choose to figure out a way to make it work, right? And so sometimes it means we have to do things a little bit differently. We're ready to, within a week, run that program as an online program. And part of that came back to, again, I'll revert back. You and I had a conversation and you gave me an idea and by golly, we tested it out and it's going to work awesome. awesome. Uh, you know, and so we're going to, you know, we can do things differently than we've ever done them before. Um, but we have to know what are the, you know, what's your break even rate? How many hours do I need to bill out? And, and what do I need to do now to get that business that's there, right? In our case, it was purely predicated on the fact that we travel well, we can't travel. So what's the next best thing? Right. So no, you know, that's the, the critical item. What is your break even rate? How many hours do I have to bill out at that rate to cover my cost of operation? And if you have that Hale and Valley account, if you have that reserve that was there, preserve that as much as you can, right? Mm -hmm. Now you start to look at it. Uh, um, how do we reserve the uh, preserve the cash that we have, right? Making wise spending decisions, right? There's a difference between spending money that can help us today and spending money just because it's what we've always done, right? And, and, and you know, I can really... Uh, probably talk myself into going and buying another set of monitors for my computer so I can work in my home office because, right. you know, uh, we won't be able to come back here. Eh, might not be the, the, the greatest choice, but will I spend a chunk of money on this new delivery method for us to be able to deliver our product? product? Absolutely. That makes all kinds of sense. Yeah, you have to. And I think it's interesting to see how those opportunities arise. And to some extent, uh, it's really good to look at a crisis situation like this and really ask that question, like, what does this make possible? Mm -hmm. Maybe it opens up a time where we finally figure out how to do that thing that we've always said we were going to do. Maybe it's for you. It's now having to be able to create that flagship program online and figure out how to make that work. I know, right. like, for example, in the church world, there's a lot of churches who uh, were not doing live streaming. We're not doing online services. They didn't have the time for it. They didn't think they had the budget for it, even though it's not really right. that expensive. And they, um, just hadn't done it. And now pretty much every church has every an church online service. And what's so interesting about that to me, just from a promotion standpoint, you know, is that on Sundays now, my entire Facebook feed is like, 
live stream of this church, live stream of this mm -hmm. church, all this like, and there's all this extra attention that didn't exist before. So that kind of creates an opportunity, I think, that didn't exist before. Um, the other thing, just going back to numbers real quick, because I think this is important for anybody who is, especially people that may not be billing hourly, is, mm -hmm. is to put together some uh, financial forecasting models that kind of predict a few different outcomes. This has been really helpful for me to kind of see what's going on. And I have this really simple tool that I created that, that allows me to just kind of get a vision for how much money I need over a 90 day period. And it's basically what short term debt do we need to pay off? What cash do we have on hand? Who owes us money? What are our receivables? And then what are our uh, retainers or our recurring revenue over that time period? Mm -hmm. and I have a little formula and it comes up with kind of a 90 day cash flow estimate. And I know what that needs to be. Um, in order to hit our, like you said, to hit the break even point. And yep. I know what it would, what I'd like it to be to hit our goals. And so now what I've been able to do is take all those numbers because what I've realized is that just because I have this big uh, amount of receivables, that doesn't matter if those people can't pay me. Right. Just because I have a, a, a large number of recurring uh, revenue clients, if those people go out of business where they just can't pay it anymore, mm -hmm. that, uh, my, that doesn't matter. And so what I've done is I've created a, a financial model that kind of shows me, hey, if 100% of our receivables and re recurring clients pay, here's where we're at. And uh, here's what our cost per day is to run the company. And so I can take that number and I can go, all right, divide that by the cost per day. Here's how many days we have to operate if we sell nothing new. And then what if only 75% of those people pay their bills? What if only 50% of those people pay their bills? What if only 25% of their people pay their bills? Mm -hmm. And I can just see it at a glance. And that has been a really helpful little tool for me because we rely so much on our recurring revenue uh, from clients that exist. And we don't build them hourly per se because they're kind of packages and products that we offer. And there right. may be other, maybe other people listening that do something like that. So that simplicity helped me a lot. And the other thing that, that I've been kind of forced into doing now, thanks to my accountant, is really a daily cash flow analysis. Um, and just like daily predicting over the next 30 days, what money do I have coming in and what money do I have going out? Just very simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to see that ahead of time, I can make decisions ahead of time so that I'm not making them in panic. And I think that's kind of the point of knowing your break even point, knowing what your hours need to be, knowing all these specifics, because then we can make decisions now that if we hit certain trigger points, I got to make this decision. If yep. I hit this trigger point, I got to make this decision. You know, and I think that, you know, that one point it, it is very critical, right? I, when I said, you know, know your break-even rate, know your hours, the other thing that, that that naturally leads into is the cash flowing in and out, mm -hmm. right? You can't live based on your profit loss statement because, again, that can tell you you're making money even if you're broke. Yeah. Right? Right. Because, again, it may take into account, you know, some receivables that haven't come in. It may take into account some of those uh, uh, non-cash expenses uh, that are there. You have to look at your numbers and, and project that cash flow based on the actual cash flowing in and flowing out. Right? So let's so, dig into that cash flow a bit because that's a big piece of the puzzle that you are really a pro at and I think probably could give people a lot of counsel and advice on. You know, what are some of the key areas or where should we start with that conversation? What's the first thing they need to think about as it relates to preserving their cash flow? Yeah, well, one of the, one of the big differences and, it, and it's also a, a misconception is uh, I have a bunch of business owners that say, well, Bill, I run my P&L on cash basis. And so, um, so I'm already doing that. <laughs> and, and, and again, there's a difference between cash basis accounting and cash flow. Yes. Right. Cash basis accounting is still cash. It's still accounting. Right? It took and, like and, and the major differences out, between cash flow and accounting uh, that they look at are number one, what is it costing you to replace your major pieces of equipment? Right. So there's a cost to doing that. Um, you know, your accounting is dealing with, uh, uh, you know, you've got depreciation, which you look at, which deals with what I paid for a piece of equipment several years ago. Cash flow, on the other hand, is going to deal with equipment replacement costs. What it's going to cost you to replace that, that equipment will be 25 to 35% higher than what's going to be listed in your depreciation. So we're already under reporting what it's costing you to run the company. Second major difference is if you have any loans. If I have a $500 monthly loan payment, um, and out of that $500 payment, $400 is going to principal and $100 is going to interest. What shows up on the profit and loss statement? It's only the $100 in interest. The $400 in principal that you paid doesn't show up at all. I mean, so apparently that wasn't an expense, right? But again, 
all 500 came out of the checkbook as cash flow, but the P&L only, only recorded $100. The P&L will only report the actual interest expense, not the principal payment. And now when you compound that and, well, I bought a truck or I bought a piece of equipment, that's a zero interest loan. That means the entire loan payment is principal and none of it shows up on your profit and loss statement. You have to be taking that piece of the puzzle into account. That's why you can't look at necessarily just the, the pro, you know, run a P&L out of your QuickBooks and see what's, what, you know, what it's telling you. What is your actual cash flow? What are the dollars that are flowing out of the checkbook? And make sure that you're accounting for all of them. Those are the two major, the two big ones. But you know, there are a couple of other smaller ones that will impact you as well. So putting together that, you know, that projection, what is it going to cost me today, right, to, you know, what checks do I have to write out that today, this week, this month, laying those out, what's the revenue that I actually have coming in, uh, and, and then, you know, you know, basically managing that piece of the puzzle. How many days of cash do I have on, uh, on hand, uh, and how long can I keep running if nothing else comes in? That was, that's an important, um, an important metric to be looking at on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think the other thing about that, that, those are huge points. Even something like, you know, I have a mortgage on my office. Mm -hmm. um, so that mortgage payment is not showing up on my P and L. Correct. Uh, that's a big chunk of change that I need to be aware of that has to go out every month. And, and one thing that I've done now too, is I have, I, I used to look at things on a monthly basis with the accountant, but then I would kind of like a, keep a weekly scorecard of kind of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now I'm actually looking at it on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, in, in the midst of Christ, I think kind of compressing your time windows of how often you're evaluating these things helps a lot because it, it just, uh, it, going back to the car analogy, allows us to see that curve a little bit more clearly. We, we mm -hmm. can make a decision a little bit better. We know exactly how much break to apply and when to apply it. Because I think in the midst of how rapidly things are changing right now, a week from now or a month from now, things might be very different if I'm reviewing mm -hmm. them then, or if I was reviewing it on a daily basis, I have a much better feel of what's going on. That might be excessive in some environments, depending on the size of the business, um, but, but certainly not in the midst of crisis, it's not. Right. Um, I, I totally agree. You know, and, and if we look back, so, you know, if we went back to the last recession, right, which was a, you know, this bubble that hit. There were a lot of companies that not going to the construction industry, uh, because there, there were a lot of companies that were, were building homes and, and involved in that process. And they didn't recognize, they weren't looking down the road to see the impact of that. And what ended up happening is they didn't make changes within their company soon enough. And it ultimately hurt them because they got too close to that curve, still going too fast, and they ended up crashing. Right? Those companies that were watching that piece of the puzzle, watching their cash flow on a regular basis, looking forward, uh, were able to make changes earlier, shift what they were doing, maybe not get rid of people, but they shifted what they were doing and how they were doing it. Mm. And, and, and it helped them weather the storm, number one. And number two, those uh, companies came out of it much stronger. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this is a key area where, especially in certain small businesses, they may not have, like, I don't have a CFO on staff. I have a virtual CFO who helps uh, once a month or occasionally. But it's been interesting, too, to see him pivot you know, their business. They, I usually only consult with him once a month. Um, and now we're having a call twice a week. Yeah. Um, and, and he is graciously doing that without charging me any more than what I already pay him on retainer. Because ultimately, he wants to, like the rest of us, he wants to show his immense value in the time of crisis. And so he's willing to put in more hours, more work, more hustle than he might otherwise do. And I guess he's doing that with all of his clients. So he's kind of got a ton more work that he's having to put in now. Mm -hmm. um, but he's doing that to help me get through this. And, and, and man, when he helps me get through this, how much more kind of committed to him and his company am I once we turn yeah. outside of the curve? And, and I think that that's a big reality for business leaders like my role typically is not to be inside of a marketing account. My role is not typically like I'm running the business, but mm -hmm. right now I told the team, like wherever and whatever y'all need me in, like you just put me in and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get it done. Um, and I think most of us that are entrepreneurs and leaders are not scared of that hard work, mm -hmm. but going back to your very first point, we also need to build in some cushion and some breathing room to just step back and go, I need to take a deep breath. Yep. I'm going to sit down on the back porch and maybe have a drink. I'm just going to relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, because this, all this stuff can be a little bit crazy whirlwind too. Let, let's move on to the next part of cash flow, which is really a big one. Um, and this is, I think, where it creates a lot of stress for people, which is workforce capacity. 
Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit and how that impacts. Well, you, it, you know, again, as things continue to change, I think that's it, it's so important here to uh, you know our the the duties that we have getting done. And for, so some companies, you know, some company leaders will have to make that decision at some point mm. of reducing staff a little bit. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe it's even not necessarily reducing staff, but we're going to go on a rotating basis. Right. So one week, you know, we'll kind of space it out. We'll, we'll give each of you two weeks a month, that kind of thing, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I think. Hold is on right there. Important. Hold on right there real quick before you yeah. go. On, I think that's really important. I don't want to skip over this. There are ways to think about your, your payroll expense and your team other than just laying people off. Yeah. I think that's really important. And you kind of just went through that, but those, those things are really big ideas. You know, one, one way is, uh, you know, payroll could just be reduced across the board. Everybody could go, look, we're going to take a 10% pay cut or a 20% pay cut across the board so that we can keep the whole team together and keep marching forward. Or we, you know, it might be a little bit more drastic, but still create the right kind of rotation where we go, all right, Work's cut back a little bit, but we want to keep the team together and I want to be able to keep paying you what we're capable of paying you. So we're going to pay you for two weeks a month instead of four weeks a month. I know that is a big hurt, but then there's kind of a cycle to that. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And at some point you may actually have to reduce your team as well. Right. But I think those are really big ideas. I want to make sure people kind of heard. Yeah, and I've been, you know what, it's one of, that's one of those things, Jay, that I've been living and breathing this for, for the last two weeks. And so, you know, I just, you're right. I kind of stepped right past it because I've been into the middle of that working with com- uh, companies. And that is one of the things that absolutely can help is, is okay. I want to keep it together. I don't want to just flat out lay you off. Right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have, you know, Jay, I'm going to have you work this week and take next week off, you know, and I'm going to have Joe take this week off. Right. He'll come in and work next week. But part of the the thing that 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 is so important at that point, then, is can both Jay and Joe do the same work? Right. There may have to be right because we all have certain specialties. And so what are you doing today to to, you know, do a little bit of cross training on your team? Right. Make sure that the things that have to happen, that multiple people are able to make them happen within the team. Um, you, you know, and, and one of the things that we always talk about outside of the crisis is, you know, can you pass the school bus test? It was the leader of the company. Can you pass the school bus test? And, 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 and meaning if I you know, am out taking a stroll you know, next week, I live next to a school. If I get hit by the school bus, uh, can my company still survive without me? Right. Well, the same thing within crisis, you know, in this time is absolutely critical is, you know, if any one person on your team is not there, right, if, you know, then can, can somebody else fill that role? Yeah. And so and, what and, kind of- and it might happen for other reasons, too, like because they might end up actually sick right. or they might yeah. have to have a close family member that they have to be taken care of or something else. So it might not even end up being because you had to lay them off because you had to cut the team down because of things that are outside of your control, too. And so that's yep. another good point of why, you know, the team needs to be cross trained to some extent. There has to be somebody who can help come take that back up. And depending how big you are, it can't always be you as the leader. I can right. do every job at my company. Um, but most of them do those jobs better than I would do them. Mm-hmm. And so, but I can't always be the one who's the backup. I, I need to have some layered responsibilities in there. So there's some overlap for sure. Well, and, and the other point of that, that's really important, Jay, is if you are the backup all the time, pretty soon you're going to be, you don't have enough time to be doing all the backup roles that you need to do and you can't lead the company. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, that's right. And then you have a real problem because all these things like managing cash flow and figuring out what the numbers are, knowing what the next decisions are, those things really do have to be done. Yep. Um, they cannot. And and there are certain things like that, that there is nobody else that can do it but you as the leader. Yeah. And, and I think those are things you have to decide. What are the things that, that I absolutely must do today? And then let me put myself in a place where I can be available to help other people depending on what their needs are. Yeah, you know, Jay, there's, when it comes to this piece of the puzzle and workforce capacity, there's one other element that we tend to overlook a little bit. In today's security-driven world, right, we're all online, everything has a password, and nothing should use the same password, right? There's, there's so many of those in, in our daily routine that we do. Um, who has those passwords? Yeah. Right? Who has the account numbers? Who has the logins, right? Because if, if again, that individual is not available today, then how do we do that? You know, how do we access those systems, right? How do we get into those? There needs to be some place, somebody who has that information and has it available. More than one person needs to, 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 to house that. 
Yeah, and a great, a great tool or resource for people who have a lot of online passwords and they need a way to distribute those and share them securely with a team. This is not an ad. I actually use this tool. Um, I wish I had an ad, but we'd have sponsors. That'd be great. But right. <laughs> uh, maybe in the future, who knows? We'll turn this into a thing. Um, is that uh, the tool that I'm talking about is called 1Password. Amazing tool. There's some others out there. There's one called LastPass that's really popular. There's a few yeah, others. LastPass. But I really like 1Password, and LastPass is great too. I have these different vaults set up within it, basically. So I have like my own personal vault. Well, only I have access to that. And then certain things within that, my assistant has access to, but nobody else does. And then, um, you know, then there's a team vault. So a lot of our uh, client passwords, everything else are in that team vault. So if a, if a team member gets added or removed from the team, they get added or removed from that vault, but we don't have to change all the passwords for everybody else. Right. Um, depending on the nature of the security. And then people can have individual passwords stored in there too, and then they can share them out to the team. That's been a great, I mean, it's a lifesaver for us because we have, oh, yeah. you know, we host hundreds of websites and have tons of passwords. So having it all centralized and in a very secure tool, I can access it from my phone or my computer. That stuff mm -hmm. is huge. Well, and, and again, the other nice part about that is in that scenario, um, if, somebody, right, because we've got this account that every 90 days we have to update the password, right? When I, when I go in and update the password, my entire team is now updated. And right. many yeah. of them give you that ability where they have access to the password, but they can't see it. Yep. So in other words, they can use it to log in, but they don't know what the password is. And so within your team, that can become a lifesaver tool, as you said, to, to make sure that we maintain this bank, this vault of passwords, uh, and account access codes uh, uh, without having to openly share them with everybody. Yeah, and that goes back to whole, the whole remote work thing too, mm -hmm. is the, some of these tools that exist that are out there like Zoom for video conferencing, 1Password for storing passwords, things like that create an environment where you can easily work from absolutely anywhere and you're not locked down to the office. I mean, the days of, you know, having a single server in the office where everything is on that server. And if you don't have access to that server, you don't have access to any of the things that is all going away or gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, another tool that we use, I'm a little off track, we'll come back to it, is um, we use the Google business suite. So we have access to Google Drive, Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, all that stored and shared securely with whoever it needs to be shared with. And so I, I, I can access, if I have internet access, I have access to every single file, every single document, it doesn't even matter what computer I'm on. I could be on a library computer and go log into my Google account and have access to everything that we need as a company. Even my own laptop back in the day, it was a real nightmare if something happened to my laptop or my mm -hmm. hard drive. It really doesn't matter that much anymore. It's almost like a dumb terminal. Uh, to some extent, the same applications and stuff are all stored in a backup. It'll just restore itself, takes a few hours, kind of a pain, but it's nothing like it used to be back in the day. So right. all those tools are huge for people as they start to have to work remote and, and, and develop plans around it. So, so let me ask this question real quick, and, and we're kind of watching our, our time a little bit, but are there a couple of, so we mentioned Zoom meetings, you and I both use those. Uh, we, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the OnePass or, or LastPass, some of those are, are huge. Um, are there any other tools that you use on a regular basis with your team uh, that can help in this remote world? Yeah, I mean, I think having a, a centralized place to keep track of projects is really important. And there's a thousand tools out there. One of them I used to use in the past, I really like, it's called Basecamp, really simple and easy to use. We now use one called Teamwork uh, Projects. Mm -hmm. Great tool. All of our projects are in there, all of our tasks in there. We know who needs to do what by when. Um, and that can be accessed from a phone, from an iPad, from a computer, from anywhere in the world that have internet access. And so to some extent, the entire team um, could be distributed all over the world. And we actually do have, we have developers all, all over the world who different, do different work for us for all throughout Europe and India, uh, in the Philippines, we got people all over the place and we all access the same centralized system. So a project system like Basecamp or Teamwork Projects is huge. A communication tool like, like Zoom for uh, visual communication. We use Slack for instant messaging, which is just kind of typing stuff back and forth to one another or screen sharing even. And, uh, and then Google, like I said, Google Suite, Business Suite, G Suite uh, is huge for us. We store all of our files there, all of our documents. Uh, Microsoft 360 does similar uh, stuff as well now. Um, but all those, those, those tool sets combined are huge for us because when we had to switch to being remote, the only thing we're really missing is just being able to be around each other. And I mm -hmm. do think that there's real value in that, especially in strategy type work. But um, thankfully, we live in a world where this technology exists because, right. gosh, even 10 years ago, Dude. I mean, the fact that Zoom is keeping up right now 
we've had a, a pretty much a lag free call. And I know for a fact, just this morning, all of my kids are on Zoom calls for their classes mm -hmm. uh, and, and tutoring and stuff. And they weren't before. Multiple right. times every kid, you know, in the world. And uh, they're doing a great job keeping up technologically. You know, one more last little piece there that, that some company owners forget sometimes is, you know, we, we, you know, many of us have switched over to voice over IP or VoIP phone systems. <laughs> well, one of the beauties about that is literally when my team left uh, last night, they all took their desk phones home with them. Because literally at that point, the beauty of that system is they can go back to their house, they plug in their phone, it comes up online. And at that point, um, it, uh, um, one moment here, at that point, it automatically uh, uh, just comes up online. And, and if somebody calls our main switchboard, it's still gonna ring on the main phone. If, if they don't answer it, it's gonna roll over to the other phones wherever they are in somebody's yeah. house. And so that piece of the puzzle can work really well from that remote piece uh, as well. Absolutely. You know, one of the other things that, uh, that I think is, is worth talking about here quick, and there's, there's two real points that I think are critical. The first one I want to cover relatively quickly is um, you know, looking for other opportunities. Mm. We are in a world right now where we absolutely can and should be looking for other opportunities. Um, and so, uh, you know, what are those things that, that, that we can do that, um, that maybe are outside of what we do today? Right, you know that that we don't normally uh, uh, aren't normally engaged with, you know. And I and I think of you know there were three real quick examples that that, that I've you know come encounter with here just in the last real short uh, couple of days is um, you know there's a pizza parlor here in town that uh, of course they, all the restaurants are closed. You know their entire business was you know in restaurant business, sit down, dine in only. Um, well, today they they have a delivery. Right, that's everything they're doing in their entire menu is delivery, but they took that one step farther, right? Because every restaurant can do delivery, but they're, you know, of course with the shortages, there's people who can't get out to do grocery shopping. There's people who can't get out to get supplies. And, you know, and so they're going, well, they they actually started marketing on their Facebook page to their customers. Hey, we can do that for you, right? I've got an entire team of people here looking for things to do. If you need to have somebody, we can order this stuff in from our suppliers. We're gonna put together a box a, you call it a care pack, whatever you want to call it, right? But, but, but we're going to have some staples in it for food. We're going to have, you know, toilet paper. We're going to have some of those other things that are in it. And you can order this on our website, just like you can order a pizza. Yeah. And, and our team will deliver it to you just like we do anything else. I mean, that's thinking outside of the box. I think about, you know, earlier you mentioned churches that are streaming online. Well, you know, our church downtown, we have a relationship with one of the homeless shelters and, 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 and there's a particular homeless shelter in, in our town that, that shut down completely. Mm, wow. and, and so there's this population that needs some kind of care. Well, we've got an entire building that's being totally unused. Mm. We partnered with the remaining homeless shelter and, and, and my God, you know, right now you walk into the worship area or into the, you know, the worship area and the gathering area and there's mats all over and, you know, there's a whole, you know, population there. We can still do something totally outside of what we do on a daily basis. And, yeah. and the third one I think of is, is, is all the distilleries around the country that are, are stopped producing product, right? You know, and, and, and they're now, they're, they're, they're actually producing hand sanitizer. Yeah. You know, the, the, there was the, even yeah. a big, a big, like, I think it was like a perfume producer or something in France that's now they they've converted their entire factory into producing hand sanitizer instead. Yeah, and it makes total sense. I saw a Facebook ad yesterday where Anheuser-Busch was doing some of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and again, so, you know, again, a lot of these places that are doing that and they're kicking out, you know, several thousand gallons of this stuff a day. Yeah. Right? That's thinking outside of the box, right? What can I do today to still help my community mm -hmm. yet still provide some kind of revenue to my business and make, you know, uh, help my team? Yeah, absolutely. I think those things are, are huge. And it's amazing. I, even like down the street from us, there's a place called Maple Street Bis Biscuit Company. Mm -hmm. And they, they just all sit down dining. And it's not, I don't even know if they're doing delivery, but they're actually selling all kind of other stuff that they have access to because of their commercial providers. So they, they turn the place into like a produce market because the grocery stores are out of produce. You can't go get any of the groceries mm -hmm. are selling out of everything. So they're, they almost turn themselves into a grocery store. They got toilet paper out there, which is like yeah. selling gold now, apparently. Right. <laughs> they've, got, they've got paper towels, they got produce, and you can just go buy it from there because the grocery stores are running out. And they, again, they're just pivoting, trying to ultimately survive through the curve 
so that uh, they can come out the other side. And, and what I've been encouraged by, as we start to kind of round out here, uh, one of the things that's really been encouraging to me is I've, I've had multiple other business owners, you know, you're one and, and several others who have called, hey, I got this idea and I'm working on this thing. And sometimes it's just putting together a little Zoom call. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's this other bigger idea that they go, you know what, I'm, I've got some time on my schedule now, the next couple of weeks, I've been thinking about doing this thing. Now I'm going to finally put together this idea and, and get this thing moving so that when we come out of this, and we will, we will come out of this. I think that's a big thing. Like people we will. Saying it. Yeah. we will come out of this. Americans and humanity as a whole has gone through much, 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 much worse. Yes. And, and we will make it out of this. And, mm -hmm. and, and I believe that if we keep our heads up and if we stay encouraged, we're going to make it out even better. But I'm encouraged by the entrepreneurs. I'm encouraged by the leaders who are not wasting the time sitting around watching the news, worried and fearful. They're using the time to do things they couldn't have otherwise done. And, and what does this make possible is such a huge right. question for me. Well, it's kind of tied in with that a little bit, Jay, and I, and I don't want to lose this point. I think it's an important one. And it's really an area that falls right into your area of expertise is what about my marketing expenses? Yeah. Right. I mean, you, know, you, you told me, Bill, we should be doing things to kind of res, uh, preserve cash a little bit. Uh, how do I deal? What do I do with my marketing expenses? Because it's not like doing an advertising today is not necessarily going to help me, is it? Yeah. What it just you say to that business owner? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's really important because for a lot of people, you know, somewhere between potentially five and even 10% of their budgets are going to marketing and advertising because you've got to get the word out if you're going to acquire new customers. And a couple of things that I think are really important as it relates to marketing in this environment. Number one, you can't be tone deaf to the reality of what's going on. Right. It's really important to look at, especially any scheduled posts. If you've got posts that are scheduled out of the next month or two, sometimes, sometimes we'll even schedule posts for a client over a whole quarter. We've had to go back through every single one of those and go, is this okay? Mm -hmm. It might be perfectly fine, you know, but is it a hard sell? Is it something that's a little bit more, you know, overly direct? Is it, is it not paying attention to the reality of what's going on? Mm -hmm. Maybe the language on those things need to be adjusted. Right. Um, there's a great quote, and it's attributed to Henry Ford, although he probably never actually said it. You know how these internet quotes are. Um, but he said something like, you know, stopping your marketing in order to save money is like stopping a clock in order to save time. And, and ultimately, stopping the clock does not save time. Time keeps moving. And business right. is going to keep moving. And, 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 and this applies directly to that race car analogy. What some people are going to do is they're going to completely cut their marketing and advertising budget. That's what some people do. Mm -hmm. And then when the curve starts to come back in, they're going to be ready to ramp things back up. But they're, they're going to be starting over in a lot of areas. They're going to right. be kind of restarting an engine. They let the engine totally stop. And now they're trying to restart it. And I think one of the most important things from a marketing standpoint is this is an opportunity for companies to shine who they are in this environment. It's an opportunity for them to talk about their core values. And it's, it's an opportunity to actually be involved with helping other people. It's an opportunity to produce content right. like this. This is marketing right now to some mm -hmm. extent, right? Sure. And, and we're both able to talk about the things that we're gifted and skilled at, but we're not doing it to make money. Not right now, but at some no. point, becoming a subject matter expert over time creates long-term value. It's a mm -hmm. long-term investment. So to me, the marketing plays right now are a couple of things. One is about kind of highlighting and showcasing who you are as a company and why you do what you do. It's also mm -hmm. about showcasing potentially, depending on what the needs are, what you can do for other people now, they're going to help them in the midst of the crisis and what you're going to do to be able to help them coming out of the crisis. And at the end of the day, good marketing should be about the customer anyway. Right. What do they want? Has that changed? And if so, how do we change? Mm -hmm. What is the problem that they have? And it has that changed? And if so, what do we have that can help address that problem? But if we totally stop it, it's the same thing ultimately that the, that the government is trying to do right now with the economy. What we do not want to happen with the economy is for it to come to a dead stop. If right. the wheels just keep turning, there's a lot of opportunity when we come around that turn to accelerate and keep the wheels turning. And but a lot of built up momentum. Stop, right? That's right. The wheels completely stop. We, we're starting so much over again. Exactly. So I'm obviously I have an embedded interest since I run a marketing agency to encourage people to not stop their marketing, but I'm not start stopping mine. Mm -hmm. um, no, are we. And, and so, which is great because you're a client, so that's good. <laughs> but, but over time, you know, uh, what I want is I want to use this time to create good messaging. And ultimately, that's all marketing is. Marketing is just good communication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are the seasons where that communication matters the most. And so, 
for people that are listening, if they have a marketing company right now that they're working with, they should, they should have, be in conversations with them just like they are with the, their accountants and going, hey, how can we communicate these things? We think our customers are dealing with these things. We want to help them. Here's some ideas of how we think and work together to communicate well over this season, but also don't neglect the reality of planning for what it's going to look like for three months from now or six right. months. Now, mm -hmm. because in six months from now, we're going to be rolling out of this thing. Maybe the economy is not fully recovered. And I'm not saying it's going to last that long either. Don't be scared if you're listening to that. But in general, we're, we're going to be ready to roll again. And right. the question is, are your wheels still turning or have they come to a complete stop? Mm -hmm. It's always harder to start from scratch than it is to, 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 to just kind of pick up and maintain again. That's right. Without a doubt. Well, Jay, we've covered some good content here, I think, in the, uh, in the last uh, hour that we've been talking. Um, and, and gosh, we could go for, for quite a bit. Longer. We probably could go all day, which is dangerous. <laughs> right. No doubt. But I think we've, uh, you know, we, we, we've covered some of this. Again, that comment that you made a minute ago is so critical. This will pass. Mm -hmm. Right. We will come out of this. This is going to end. It's not, you know, I, I've heard, heard the term lately again, and it's more media hype, right, is, is the new normal. I hate that term. I hate it too. It's not a new normal. Not. This is a temporary normal. Yes. You know, it's just here for a short period of time. We need to walk our way through and then we'll go back to normal. Yeah. And so it, it's critical that we remember that. I think it's, uh, it's important to just, uh, you know, those couple of big items that we talked about, right? Breathe. Stop. Take a breath, right? Relax just a moment. Don't make decisions based out of fear, right? Take care of your team. What are things that you're doing to, to not only take care of them physically, but mentally and spiritually and, mm -hmm. and, and making sure that they're still whole as they're walking through this thing as well. They're looking to you as a leader for some of that. Yeah. Right. Preserve your cash flow, right? Know your numbers. Be looking at that on a daily basis. Don't give that stuff up. Use some of the tools that are available on the, uh, uh, you know, the electronic tools for the remote working that we're doing today. Right, leverage those. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to get into something that you've not used before that, that when you come out of this thing, it's going to actually be a whole new piece of the puzzle for you that you haven't dealt with before. And, and I think, uh, you know, again, uh, just always be looking at what can you do different today? How can we maintain that momentum as we uh, move through and come out of this thing? Uh, those are my final thoughts on it. Jay, anything else that you'd want to add to that? Yeah, you know, the last thing I would say I've been thinking about is – there was a political advisor a little while back that got in a little trouble for saying this, but I, I think that the root of it is actually right. And he, I think it's the, the tone of how it was said, but he said something like, never waste a good crisis. Mm -hmm. And it com that comes off very poorly when people are in serious crisis. Right. But I think as it relates to business owners and entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I would say that don't waste this crisis. And what I mean by that is, I'm not saying take advantage of people. I'm not saying overuse opportunity. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is get out from in front of the news. Don't sit and worry and fret. Plan, prepare, and work. I mean, entrepreneurs and leaders who are listening to this, this is what you are made for. And, and great leaders are not afraid of great crisis. If anything, they are the moment where they get to shine. And ultimately, our job is to encourage those people around us, which is what you and I are trying to do with everybody today, right. and, and find the bright side, because there will be one. This is not the new normal. I hate that term, too. Um, we're going to come out of this better and stronger. I, I believe that, and I'm encouraged uh, by our conversation today. Absolutely. 